This virtual community lecture uh, will be given by Dr. Joseph Lee, who is one of our spine surgeons here at Rothman Orthopedics, and he is also the chief of spine surgery at Phelps Hospital. He specializes in minimally invasive spine surgery and is currently seeing patients out of our Harrison, Terrytown, and Manhattan offices. Um, and the topic that Dr. Lee will be speaking on tonight is what's new in the treatment of low back pain. If you have any questions throughout the time um, of Dr. Lee's presentation, feel free to type your questions down below in the Q&A box, and we will go over all of those questions uh, once Dr. Lee has done his presentation. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Jen. Uh, I just want to share my screen. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, I know in a different time we'd be doing this in person, and so we could uh, meet everyone. And uh, but for, for now, this virtual meeting will suffice. And obviously, we want to make this very interactive. So if you do have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. And I'm just going to share my screen here. All right, so can everyone see my screen? Jen or Reggie? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, so we're going to be talking today about low back pain. Um, obviously, it's a very, very common topic, a uh, very common problem that we see. And, um, you know, today the, the, we'll talk about some of the anatomy of, of how people get back pain. We'll talk about the causes of back pain. We'll talk about when you should see a spine surgeon. And then we'll talk about some of the current treatment options that exist. So why do we talk about back pain? And, and number one, it's one of the most common things that we'll see, not only in the primary care office, but as well as, as, as a spine surgeon's office. The great news about back pain, even though it's so common, is that 90% of people will get better. The problem is that of that 90%, more than three quarters of patients will get a recurrent or flare up. Uh, and unfortunately, about 10% will have chronic low back pain. It unfortunately is the number one reason to be out of work and a immense amount of healthcare dollars are being spent on it to treat low back pain. So we'll start off by talking about low back pain. And, you know, we went into orthopedics because we like to understand anatomy and understand how when anatomy is affected, it can cause uh, symptoms. So with regards to low back pain, the four anatomic structures that we'll talk about is muscle, bone, disc, and nerves. And we'll, we'll talk uh, one by one. So the number one, two, and three causes of back pain in most people are muscle. It could be the strain or sprain or muscle spasms that, that people experience. So typically what ends up happening is people have normal muscles. They injure it for whatever reason, whether they're shoveling heavy snow, they're playing with their grandkids, or they're playing sports. The muscle will recover, but oftentimes patients don't spend enough time with the recovery process. So they come back too soon and they re-aggravate uh, the muscle. So then you'll get more bleeding, more inflammation, more scarring. And it becomes a pretty vicious cycle where the muscle loses its ability to contract normally and it's more prone to injuries. In the lower back, there's four sets of muscles, and this is an axial MRI. So if you were to cut your spine like a pepperoni slice and looking straight down on top of it. So on the top of this screen, you can see the, the big blood vessels. The spine is here in the middle. Here is the disc. You can see the Y here. These are the bones in the back. And then you can see the muscles that surround the spine. So there's two parts of the core. There's like the six pack, which is, you know, one part of the core where everyone likes to work on, but really the most important part of the core is, is these muscles right here. And they include the psoas muscle, which is demarcated in the yellow. This muscle helps with hip flexion. And then you have the three sets of low back muscles that are seen in the pink, light blue, and the green. And these back muscles act like muscle buffers that travel along the spine. And it helps take away some of the stress that our body puts on the the, the spine itself by acting as a buffer. The second most common cause is discs. Now discs, they are two parts of a disc. There's an outer ring that's strong and fibrous. It's called the annulus fibrosis. And this material contains the jelly part, which is the nucleus pulposus. 
and it acts like a cushion between the vertebral bodies, uh, allows us to have motion, it allows us to protect the nerves. Now, when people talk about, you know, what causes issues in the spine, what comes first, in the spine, all pathologies start off with a problematic disc. And there's different types of disc issues that we'll see, and, and here's a spectrum of them. On the left, you'll see an annular tear, and this is equivalent in just a tear of the outer ring. So there's no actual extrusion or disc herniation, and uh, this often results in quite a bit of low back pain. This can create a chemical inflammation around the nerves and ca cause pain shooting down uh, into the leg. Oftentimes, these will calm down with medications and therapy. In the middle, you see the herniated disc, where the outer ring becomes truly incompetent, and you can have both bulges or extrusions or protrusions of disc material hitting the nerve. So this becomes a more of a structural problem, structural compression of the nerves traveling in the spine. On the far right, you can see what we call degenerative disc disease. Now, this is more of a kind of an end-stage disc problem where the inner jelly material becomes significantly degenerative, the outer ring starts to fail completely, and now you see complete collapse of the bone. Sometimes the bone becomes so collapsed, you can see bruising between the edges of the bone, which you can see on the right. This is called modic type changes, and this is indicative of back pain. This can also lead to quite a bit of nerve issues. Degenerative disc disease often presents with something called discogenic back pain. It's when people come into the office and they have significant axial truncal back pain that is predominantly worse when someone sits and they transition from a sitting to a standing position. Uh, it can be associated with leg symptoms. On an MRI, you'll see these classic findings where the disc has completely collapsed. We'll see some slippage of the bone and then we'll see some changes within the uh, end plates. Herniated disc is a very common problem that we see. The, the most common analogy that we use is a jelly donut. Um, with the outer frame of the disc being the donut itself and then the jelly that comes out being the herniated material. It most commonly happens at the bottom two level parts of the spine at L4-5 and L5-S1. And the reason why is these are the levels that experience the most strain in the lower back. Uh, clinically, patients will present with back pain uh, and usually it's stiffness for a few days in the back and then they'll have pain radiating down the leg. Now, depending on which nerve is affected, people could have pain in the front of the leg, people can have pain in the buttock, hamstring into the calf. Sometimes people will have pain that goes into the tailbone as well as the perianal region. So depending on the clinical history, we can ascertain which levels are problematic. People will complain of pain that's worse with coughing and sneezing or any type of activity where they have to bear down. On exam, and it will check for your motor strength. We always are very uh, nervous about weakness in the motor group because that indicates that the nerve is being significantly damaged. On exam, uh, physical examination, there's a maneuver called a straight leg raise. Will it be suggestive uh, that you may have a disc herniation. What this really is is when we have you lay down and we lift your leg up, and if that recreates that pain down the leg, this suggests that you have a disc herniation and have some nerve tension signs. The number three cause of back pain is bone and nerve, and we'll group these together. And the most common uh, problems that people talk about is spinal stenosis. And spinal stenosis is a disease of age, so if we all live long enough, we're all going to get this. Clinically, it presents with neurogenic claudication. And when people uh, talk about neurogenic claudication, there's a variety of symptoms that people get. Most of the symptoms that are common with patients with spinal stenosis is that they have back pain and leg discomfort that is significantly worse with standing or walking. And they feel immediate relief when they sit or they lean over. So if you go to the grocery store, and you see people leaning over the shopping cart, sometimes that's a sign that people have spinal stenosis. So if you look here on the MRI on the right, on the, on the one side you can see the normal and you can see the center, so you can see the disc and you can see the V here, which is the bones in the back, and this white circle with the gray dots floating here in the middle. So the white circle is the spinal fluid sac that protects the nerve. 
And then the gray dots here are the actual nerve rootlets that travel uh, through the spine. And you can see how much space there is for the nerves here, which is great. Now here on the right, you can see an example of severe spinal stenosis. You can no longer see that white circle with the gray dots floating in the middle. You in essence only see a, gray, a clump of gray nerves right here in the middle. Now what causes this? Like I said before, this pathology always causes all of the issues. But what really happens is as a disc fails, the joints in the back have to compensate. And so you can see here on the left, you can see how nice and clean the joints are. But here on the right, the joints look very irregular. They become hypertrophic, meaning they grow in size. There's a ligament in the spine that can become thickened as well. And all of these together, the facet joint being overgrown, ligament overgrowth, as well as disc pathology, can all lead to nerve compression. This leads to spinal stenosis. And here you can see the yellow being the normal nerve space, and on the right, the right side being the red, being severe nerve compression. Other bone issues that we'll see are actually instability uh, in the spinal column. So here on the left is something called spondylolisthesis. And if you break that term down in, from a Greek standpoint, it's literally a slippage of the spine. And what happens here is that when there's th different versions of this, and the most common ones are the degenerative type, where again, the disc becomes problematic, the facet joints fail, and the bone starts to slip. And as the bone starts to slip, it can drag the nerve with it. Sometimes you can have a fracture that results in instability. You can have the same type of slippage here. And then other patients will present with significant scoliosis. There are children who will have scoliosis called adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. And then there's adults who can get this who did, didn't have scoliosis when they were younger, but as they've gotten older, the discs have broken down asymmetrically and they develop scoliosis. It can be quite disabling. Fractures are another common cause of back pain. Unfortunately, there's multiple causes for fractures. The most common one is bone density issues, so osteoporotic compression fractures. This usually is trauma-induced. It usually will affect our um, the older females in our, in our practice, where it can also impact anybody on certain medications like immunosuppressants, people who've had chronic COPD and are steroid inhalers, their bone density will be weak as well and they are prone to compression fractures. And unfortunately, sometimes we'll see patients with the unfortunate diagnosis of cancer in the spine, and that can lead to fractures as well. All of these can cause disabling back pain. Sometimes patients have back pain for non-orthopedic issues. And, you know, especially in our younger patients or patients when we get MRIs and we don't really see significant pathology and they have excruciating back pain, we have to make sure that there are not other medical issues for the cause of their back pain. The most common cause of back pain or muscular back pain that's actually not back pain is a kidney stone. Uh, when people go to the ER and they have intense flank pain, you know, the, the most common diagnosis is a kidney stone. You can have a kidney infection as well that presents similarly. For our female patients, they can have uterine infections or endometriosis. Uh, that presents with back pain as well. Sometimes in thoracic regions, you can have ulcers in the stomach or pancreatitis can, can give you higher low back pain, a higher back pain as well. And that's something that needs to be elucidated. And then in certain patients, now this is more rare, people have back pain, but they have other pain as well, other joint pain, joint swelling. And this is the inflammatory arthropathy group. So Conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, ankylosing spondylitis, these are inflammatory conditions where your body has a hyperactive uh, immune system and it affects the whole skeletal system. And this can result in significant back pain. So this obviously is part of a cause of back pain. Obviously, musculoskeletal causes are probably the number one issue when people have back pain. But we have to also entertain the possibility that these are some of the uh, other diagnoses and differentials uh, when people present to our office. So let's talk about how we treat back pain. Uh, since we talked about the causes, and, and again, just for a quick review, it's muscle, muscle, muscle as the first uh, most common uh, reasons for back pain. Then you have the disc, bones, and the nerves as causes of back pain. We, we treat each different 
causes of back pain differently. So initially, as long as no neurologic deficit, patients can undergo uh, an extensive course of non-operative treatment. And this is really everything under the sun prior to surgery. So what, what do we mean by that? So you can take medications. Anti-inflammatories are our first go-to option for this. And there's medications like Advil's and Aleve's that they can, uh, people can take, but we have a lot more stronger anti-inflammatories that can be very helpful. Muscle relaxers in a short course, same thing with pain medication, uh, can be helpful in terms of dealing with back pain. You know, pain medication is a sensitive subject with a whole opioid crisis going on right now. Uh, we obviously don't want to use opioid medication if we can avoid it, but in the extreme situation with severe back pain, a short course of pain medication can be helpful. Physical therapy is obviously a very big, uh, big part of our non-operative treatment, as well as injections. You know, a lot of times, the tincture of time is the most important. So, you know, everyone hurts, and when people are hurting, they're very frustrated. They want the pain to be gone yesterday. But if people can survive the first two to six weeks of their back pain, and we do with some of these treatments, 90% of people will get better. And so a lot of times when people come to the office, we'll do the workup to make sure there's nothing significantly uh, worrisome in your back. But if it's just typical back issues, muscular issues, the good news is it'll get better. And we a lot of times will preach patience in, in terms of the recovery process. So we'll talk about physical therapy first. If anybody, uh, comes to my office for the first time with new onset back pain. Everyone leaves my office with a script for physical therapy. And, you know, people with COVID right now are nervous about going to physical therapy centers, which is completely understandable. So a lot of the physical therapy places, such as the ones that we have in Harrison, will provide you with a pamphlet that can show you all these exercises. And I tell my patients that I would love for them to do these exercises you know, 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes at night, uh, in addition to low impact cardio exercises and whatever uh, workout routine that they like to do. And uh, I find that this is very helpful for patients to prevent flare ups uh, once we have diagnosed their issues. Other non operative management options include ice and heat. People ask me always what's better, and I believe both are great when you have the acute flare up. You want to use ice to calm things down. And the analogy that I use is if you have a sprained ankle, you don't put your ankle in a hot tub. You put an ice pack on it. So similar to the back. And then you use heat to stay loose. Uh, I love deep tissue massages. I think chiropractor in the sh acute setting is okay. Long-term manipulations really have no place in our treatment option. Acupuncture, yoga, Pilates, these are all alternative options that are uh, available for patients to try and treat their back pain. Medical marijuana has become uh, more of a hot topic in our world in terms of treatment of chronic back pain. There are some studies that are out, although not high quality, but studies showing some positive benefit for the use of CBD or THC compounds for the treatment of low back pain. But this is something that we should discuss in the office. And you know, I'm a believer of this in myself. This is my wife and I um, doing aerial yoga. Uh, I'm not sure I can do this anymore, but uh, you know, this is about five years ago. And, and, and I think if you can engage all treatment options as you may, I think it's warranted. Now, why is physical therapy important? We have studies showing that it's sometimes as good or better than surgical treatment for low back pain. So this is an interesting study. It's a randomized control study, which is a, a study type that they blind, they, they tell patients who are enrolled, they're either gonna get surgery or they're gonna get physical therapy. Um, so we had 64 patients. These were patients who had low back pain. They had MRI evidence of degenerative disc disease at the bottom two levels and they had one year follow-up. So they compared one group that had spine fusion surgery, which is the screws and the rods, and they compared them to a group that had physical therapy, and CBT stands for cognitive behavioral therapy. And, and, and there's a lot of different versions of this, but the most common one is teaching patients proper uh, back movement and understanding that there is some component of fear that makes people avoid certain activities, and they train people to kind of understand what moves are safe, what moves are, 
are going to be causing problems, and they help process they help patients process their fear of aggravating their back. And they measured uh, something called the ODI, it's a Swissery Disability Index. It's a specific patient reported outcome that evaluates people's uh, uh, assessment of their own back pain. And if you look here at one year fob on this graph, you can see that the ODI improvements from beginning to one year are very, very similar. Um, you know, there's a little bit more reduction of the ODI with regards to effusion compared to the physical therapy, but still, uh, you know, when patients were asked, was it successful? Pretty darn similar. Uh, between the two groups. Now in the surgery group, there's an 18% complication rate, so that didn't happen in the uh, PT group, obviously. And there was no difference in the use of narcotics, their emotional distress, their satisfaction with their life, as well as return to work. So again, this study, albeit it's a small study, really shows the, the really the positive uh, benefits of physical therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy. So when patients come into the office, this is why it's so important that we try a course of physical therapy because it can be very, very helpful. Epidural injections are the next option after physical, a course of physical therapy and people have significant pain. Uh, I really like epidurals when there's uh, MRI evidence of a disc pathology, whether it's an annular tear or disc herniation. And you know, there's a, another good randomized control study for uh, spinal stenosis and leg symptoms, comparing the use of lidocaine and steroid, and they at the end show that injections are very helpful. So with the combination of physical therapy, medications like NSAIDs and muscle relaxers, as well as injections, 90% of people will get better. There is a newer procedure that's come out recently, and this procedure has been around for five years. There has been more research presented recently to this, and this is a unique procedure that's done in the hospital or surgical center. Uh, this is called the intercept procedure. Now there are specific requirements that we need to see clinically, as well as on the MRI that will qualify you for this study. And in essence, this is very similar to the kyphoplast that people will get for uh, compression fractures. So we can inject a cannula, a small needle into the bone, we can thread or pass a wire to a specific spot in the bone. And in essence, we microwave a small nerve called, called the basiopatibal nerve. And this nerve innervates the end plates. And this is what they call vertebrogenic back pain. And they have multiple studies randomized in nature, which indicates kind of a higher quality study showing significant improvement of back pain in the setting of degenerative disc disease. So this is such a new procedure that currently at its, in the current state, there's no insurance coverage for it. They will have insurance coverage starting next year. So this is an exciting uh, treatment option for patients. And this could be a significant stopgap between the interventional pain management for back pain versus surgical intervention. When is surgery required? So sometimes, I tell patients in the office, you know, you need surgery or do you want surgery? Now, these are situations where you really don't have a choice and you need surgery. Uh, and, and certain conditions include neurologic deficit. So when you have a foot drop where you have significant disc pathology where the nerve is being damaged to the point where the muscles are no longer working, so the nerve is not sending a signal to the muscle, the muscle doesn't work. The most common one that we see in the lumbar spine pathology is a foot drop, where you try to bring your foot up in the air like this, and it doesn't work. It's, it's floppy. Sometimes people have severe, like a massive disc herniation like this here on the MRI, and they develop something called Cauda-Quina syndrome. This is a, a syndrome that's a surgical emergency. This usually involves severe back pain, leg pain. They get uh, saddle anesthesia, which is numbness on the inner thighs and the perianal region, they'll experience some disturbances in bowel and bladder, and when it becomes too severe, they'll get weakness and painless incontinence. This is surgery at 2 a.m. When if it, if it were to occur, thankfully it's very rare, uh, but it is something that as surgeons and, and ER docs that will see patients that come into the uh, hospital 
are very, very uh, uh, worried about. When patients present with progressive weakness or myelopathy, which is spinal cord compression, we often recommend uh, surgery. And then when you have an unstable fracture like this due to high trauma, this is spine surgery, uh, no questions asked. So uh, that's very rare. Um, and so in most of the times when people come in with pain, functional pain where they can't do certain things, spine surgery works for the right indication. So this is probably one of the more famous uh, studies that we have. It's called the SPORT trial, and they compared surgery versus non-op treatment for the most common three diagnoses, herniated disc, spinal stenosis, and spondylolisthesis. And this is their eight-year data and shows that for each of these diagnoses, spine surgery was more effective than non-operative treatment for herniated discs, spinal stenosis, and spondylolisthesis. So I tell all of my patients, you try physical therapy, you try medications, and you try injections, and you really are not happy with the degree of pain that you're in, how disabled you are, how you can't do fun things like playing golf or going to work or playing with your grandkids, spine surgery can be a very effective tool for you. Now, what type of spine surgeries do we do for back pain? The most common one that you'll see is something called a microdiscectomy. I specialize in minimally invasive surgery, and we've made a big push in the last decade or two to really uh, advance our knowledge and our use of minimally invasive techniques. Uh, it results in faster recovery, less blood loss, less infection, less muscle damage, and we can achieve the same surgical goals of taking pressure off the nerve. So this is an example of an incision. It's no bigger than a, a quarter. You can see that we can take out a large disc herniation, almost five centimeters like this, to a, 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 you know, a 14 millimeter port. And most of our cases that we do for this is done outpatient. And we do a lot of these at Phelps Hospital like this. Lumbar fusions uh, are utilized when we have patients with spinal anesthesia, so instability in the spine, as well as uh, deformity, scoliosis, or fractures. And you know, when, when people come into the office and we show them these pictures, you know, they all have the same response. Uh, you know, they get a little pale in the face and, you know, they get a little bit kind of overwhelmed. They stop listening to everything that I say. You know, spine fusion surgery has evolved uh, quite a bit. You know, this is a very common procedure that we do. Uh, we've started to do a lot of these uh, in a minimally invasive technique, and we've now developed a lot of technology to help us do this safely and efficiently. And we have a lot of this technology here at Phelps in Northern Westchester where we do a lot of surgeries. We have intraoperative navigation. So what happens is we'll do a lot of our surgical decompression work. And then we can bring in a machine that takes a 3D picture of your spine while you're on the table and allows us to guide and place screws in very accurately. We have robots now that can help us place screws. We have newer implants that help with faster fusions or more uh, robust fusions. And then we have different ways of treating pain that help, pay, that help uh, uh, the recovery process to be much more smooth because we don't need to use uh, that much narcotic in the recovery. So here's what traditional spine surgery looks like. And you can see certain pathologies require this type of, uh, this type of exposure. But you can see, look how much muscle damage there is. Um, you know, we're stripping all the muscles off the bone. We put retractors in them for several hours. There invariably is going to be muscle damage there. However, we can do a lot of these same uh, problems through small incisions. So this is an example of one of my cases where we can do a minimally invasive fusion. You can see that we can place wires through uh, the spine uh, under fluoroscopic guidance. And then we can place these screws and cages in uh, through incisions that are no bigger than uh, a, a quarter. And, you know, patients with this type of uh, recovery, or with, with, with this type of surgery can oftentimes go home the same day or 95% of my practice will go home the next day. So it's a very, very effective treatment option. We achieve still the same surgical goals, meaning we take the pressure off the nerves and we stabilize the spine when we need to. Sometimes patients will have back pain after surgery. And th this obviously uh, can be very frustrating. Uh, 
The most common cause of this is progression of this disease. So, so let's say patients will have a laminectomy or microdiscectomy, and they had it 20 years ago. Discs, unfortunately, do not heal. They don't have the ability to heal themselves because they don't have very good blood supply to them. So they will eventually experience more breakdown. And then we'll see someone who had a laminectomy several years ago, and then they come back and we'll see instability at that same level or we'll see advancement of their degenerative disc disease, and this can lead to more back pain. The other possibility is when people get a fusion done, that we'll see disease at the level above and below. Now, this happens about 10% of the time at, uh, at, at, at 10 years, so it's not guaranteed, but the rationale behind is that you take away a certain level of motion when you do a fusion, and you still want to achieve certain functional activities, whether it might be you know, bending to put your shoes in or twisting to swing a golf club, and you will develop problems at the levels above and below because they take on more stress. Now, unfortunately, it's really controversial. It's hard to say if that degeneration occurred because of the actual surgery itself or if it's, occur if it's occurred because people have gotten older. It's probably a combination of both, but we oftentimes do see this and unfortunately, this can lead to more issues and require more treatment. When people get fusions done, sometimes people with, uh, who are heavy smokers, who are on, on immunosuppressants or chronic steroids, sometimes the fusion itself doesn't hold. When people look at a fusion, what, you know, everyone sees the screws in the rod, but what really a fusion is, and, and what we will show people in the office after, is we actually take a lot of bone graft from the patient's spine, we'll augment it with synthetic uh, autograph and allograph, and we'll actually kind of paste it around the screws and the rest of the spine. And what we really want is that bone mass to fuse to the, the spine that you have. And the screws and the rods and the cages that we put in are designed to hold the spine still until that bone welds in together. And that process starts around three months and really takes more than four to six months to become really solid. So certain patients, for whatever reason, the biology and the fusion does not take hold, and we'll see that the fusion starts to fail. We'll start to see screws changing position. We'll see cages migrating, and this unfortunately requires additional surgery. You can have infections, unfortunately. You can have nerve scarring um, after back uh, surgery that can lead to this, uh, pain. A very common uh, cause of back pain, in, especially with open traditional surgery, is postoperative muscle damage. If you look here on the MRI, you can see the two circles here in the front, and this is your psoas muscle. You can see how nice and black that muscle is. And you can see here in the back, there's no, none of that muscle there. And this is complete atrophy of muscle after uh, open spine surgery. So this can happen. You know, there are studies showing that people can have low back pain after uh, open fusion surgery up to a year. Uh, and unfortunately, there's really not much we can do about this. So this kind of really shows the importance of minimally invasive, especially if it's possible, uh, because it can help protect uh, the low back muscles. Here's an example of an adjacent leg, uh, segment disease. This is a patient, 60-year-old uh, gentleman, uh, at that time who underwent seven prior surgeries in the lower back and you can see at the level above where he has his screws and rods you can see that the disc space here is significantly collapsed and he was having significant back pain and leg pain if you look at the mri here again you can see what a normal disc looks like up here with a light gray and then at where the red line is you can see how collapsed that disc is and this is with that degenerative disc pain that we talked about um, and so, and here's the, the, the CT scan showing significant fusion at the prior level and then the significant disc space collapse. So there's a lot of different ways of addressing this, you know, to go back in for the eighth time and take out the instrumentation, extend the decompression and put new screws in is a viable option, but that really exposes patients to potential higher risk for infection, bleeding. There's going to be scarring through the, the nerve sacs. So there could be a chance of dural tears and spinal fluid leaks that uh, can be very challenging to deal with. So for this particular patient, I offered him a minimally invasive technique going through the side of the spine. It's called a lateral inner body fusion. 
This has become significantly more popular in the last 10 years. And we can achieve the same surgical goals of freeing up the nerves and stabilizing the spine without even having to go through the prior uh, surgical area and risk infection, um, higher bleeding, and nerve uh, spinal uh, fluid problems. And this patient went home the next day. So for people who've had spine surgery already and they have persistent symptoms and we find that they have problems above, we can take out the old instrumentation, which is fine. But if, it, it, if there's an opportunity, sometimes we'll do this minimally invasive lateral inner body fusion and people have excellent outcomes uh, with this type of procedure. Here's an example of pseudoarthrosis where the, the screws don't weld them together. Now, this is a surgery done by another sur uh, This is a case done by another surgeon. She came into the ER with severe back pain, and what you can see here, you know, in the middle slide, you can see where the red arrows are, and you can see the screw, and there's this black space around the screw. And what has happened here is that this, because the bone has never really fused, the screw started to window wiper inside the bone and the screw started to erode the bone. And what ended up happening is on the far right, you can see this dotted oval that I have. It. This demarcates the margins of a cage that the prior surgeon had put in. You can see where the cage wants to be, but the, where the actual cage ended up being. And you can see that this cage literally spit out of the spine and was resting inside the nerve sac. And this occurred because her bones didn't weld Unfortunately, she's a heavy smoker, a young patient, and invariably, if the fusion does not take hold biologically, the metal will eventually fail, and this is what happens. And so she undergoes a revision surgery where we have to take out the old screws, put bigger screws in, we put more instrumentation in to get more uh, fixation, and now she's doing significantly better. But obviously, you know, we try to avoid this by telling patients preoperatively, we have to optimize the chances for success. I love for my patients to stop smoking for three months after surgery if feasible, or even cut down 50% if, if, if possible. We have different medications that we can use during surgery to help augment fusion. So we have a lot of things to help minimize it, but even with our best efforts, sometimes uh, the, the spine does not fuse and we will have problems with that. So in conclusion, uh, back pain is a very common problem. Uh, in my practice, unless you have uh, a significant neurologic problem with weakness, we always start off with conservative treatment. And that's going to be the physical therapy, medications, and injections. There are some newer, exciting, uh, non-operative treatment options on the horizon that will be available for patients to use uh, prior to having surgery. Surgery is very effective. Um, in my practice, I, I try to say it as the last resort for, for most of my patients. Uh, surgery is incredibly effective if you do it for the right indications um, and for the right pathology. You know, in my practice, I love it. I, I, I look for patients who have back pain and leg symptoms. Um, that'd be the most effective. Uh, there are the patients who will experience most improvement. Obviously, the weakness or bowel bladder problems will have no choice but to do surgery. So. Uh, in the end, I'm very conservative on when we need to do surgery. But if you have failed all conservative treatment options and you really cannot deal and function with the level of pain that you have, surgery can be a very effective tool and we can do this minimally invasive. And with minimally invasive techniques, your recovery is faster, you have less uh, you know, blood loss and infection, and, and your ability to, you know, your, your need for uh, narcotics post operative oftentimes is a lot less than traditional open surgery. So with that, um, we'll take some questions. I hope, I, I thank everyone for participating today. Uh, I, I know that when patients have severe back pain that uh, it's a very frustrating process uh, and, and, and frustrating, frustrating issue. So, uh, you know, we're happy to, to see you in our office uh, and we can always do the full workup, you know, get MRIs for you, start with the physical therapy and offer you a, a tailored treatment plan for you. So thank you very, uh, very much for your attention today. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Looks like we have one question um, right now. And that is, if a patient still has pain and other options did not work, even though it is surgery, what are your thoughts on putting in a TENS unit? 
Great. So a tend unit is, uh, I think, what uh, the patient is asking is actually a spinal cord stimulator. So the analogy that I use about the spinal cord stimulator is when you go bang your knee on the corner of a table and you have intense pain, most of us will rub their knee very quickly to help minimize the pain. And what, what you're actually doing is your brain senses two receptors, pressure, pressure uh, receptor and a pain receptor. And if you can overwhelm the brain with the pressure receptor, it doesn't have the ability to kind of sense the pains. So when the pain fibers calm down, you feel better. The spinal cord stimulator does something similar to that. So when patients have spinal surgery done and they have persistent pain or numbness and tingling in the legs, and then we get MRIs and CTs to make sure that the prior fusion or decompression was done well, and there's really no structural explanation for that pain or numbness, then that's that patient population that I recommend to trial at least the spinal cord stimulator. So we'll send you to a pain management doctor. They can place this uh, lead into your back and they can actually trial it. And they have different programs now that, can, that they can alter remotely to see how they can cover your pain best. And if it works well for you, you can get the permanent implant with a battery placed in. The one issue with the spinal cord stimulator um, especially with some of the older units is that you can never get an MRI again with that, uh, with that implant placed. And oftentimes if you do have problems at other levels in the spine, that stimulator can get in the way and it oftentimes requires a removal of the stimulator and that can be a, a, a challenging process sometimes. So to answer that question, it's an option when people have had back surgery, we've confirmed that there's really nothing wrong with the surgery done and there's nerve scarring or arachnoiditis which is the clumping of nerve roots inside the, the spinal fluid canal uh, spinal fluid sac and they can trial it always and if it works then great um, uh, you can get the permanent implant placed and then i see another question here about uh, patients with minimally invasive spine fusion and timeline for sports. So that's a great question. Uh, the, probably the best example for any avid golfer is Tiger Woods. Uh, his history is pretty complicated. He started off with multiple clean out procedures with microdiscectomy. Uh, and at the end, there was really no more discs to take out. He had quite a bit of disc space collapse. And they ended up doing something called an anterior lumbar interbody fusion, which is a similar procedure in terms of a fusion. This, there, the procedure that he underwent didn't require screws and rods in the back, but they did a cage to the front. And it's a very good option for people with degenerative disc disease and nerve pain. It's a, a, a very effective procedure. But as you may are aware, prior to his you know, catastrophic car accident, he had another back surgery prior to having that leg injury. So a fusion itself, unfortunately, limits your range of motion. The golf swing, unfortunately, is a very stressful swing, a uh, stressful uh, uh, event for the back. It's unfortunate because I love golf as well. And I, I know it's bad for my back as well, but you know, if you're a golfer, you, you'll do whatever you got to do. Um, so for a timeline, I usually tell people for the first three months, you can chip and putt only. From three months to six months, I'll let you do short iron work. And I usually don't let people swing a full on, you know, long club, whether it's a uh, wood or a driver for about six to nine months. Um, if you have any pain uh, in that time frame, we usually kind of cut, you know, we'll dial you back and, and work on your range of motion, your flexibility. Uh, before we let you going back to, to full uh, golf. Uh, so I usually tell people that, you know, you'll, if you start thinking about your season, you know, I usually tell people to get their survey done in November or December. So by the time April 1 comes around, the golf season opens up, you're, you're at least being able to, you know, uh, hit your wedges and your short irons. So that's a great question. 
right. there's another question here I see about mm -hmm. surgery on the SI joint. Um, so that's another great question. Um, so this is an, actually another uh, example of Jason segment problems. So when people get a fusion from L4 to S1, which is the bottom few levels, uh, the next joint distally is actually the sacroiliac joint. And there are studies showing that 40% of people with a lumbar L4 to S1 fusion will get degeneration of the SI joint. And there's been a lot of advances in the diagnosis and treatment for SI joints. There's some physical exam uh, maneuvers that we'll do in the office to uh, pinpoint if the SI joint is actually the cause of your pain. The problem with the SI joint, is aft, it often acts like a pinched nerve. People will have back pain, kind of pelvic pain, but they also have pain coming down the leg. One of the most important things to get a diagnostic injection to see if that's the source of the pain. And if you fail all the conservative treatment for the SI joint, including exercises, medicines, and injections, then sometimes there's a small procedure that we do. It's a, it's a, minimally, invest, a minimally invasive SI fusion. It's outpatient that people can undergo to address that symptom. Awesome. And we have a few more questions in our chat box. Um, one from Cheryl asked, um, they've had a lot of patients for back and leg pain over the years and one injection has now worked. Also had a partial disectomy about 20 years ago. Also have osteoarthritis and osteoporosis. Any thoughts? Yeah, so for, thanks for your question, Cheryl. Um, that is really a great example of the progression of this disease uh, after having some type of surgery. So a partial discectomy to me 20 years ago, uh, at that time, the thought was to do what we call a more of a total discectomy. They would take more disc uh, to, to, to address the issues. Uh, once you get spine surgery and you have disc surgery done, the disc never heals. Like, like I always tell patients, you get an MRI now and five years later, you'll be very lucky if the MRI looks the same at that disc. What that really means is that your disc will get worse. Now, 20 years is a long time, so I'm sure that if we were to MRI you again, that there'll be significant degeneration of that disc. And that's going to lead to more back issues, more nerve compression that can lead to your back pain, your leg pain. And it seems like you're doing all the right things with physical therapy and injections. And so, you know, you're a, per you're a patient that would benefit from an MRI and making sure that we have a, a clear picture of what's going on in the back and see if there's something that we can do for you. Osteoporosis is a very challenging problem in our field. Uh, you know, I, uh, everybody will get it. And unfortunately, it affects our females, unfortunately, higher proportion. And osteoporosis can lead to a lot of issues, especially if you need a fusion surgery. Uh, but there are a lot of new medications that are out there that can help combat the progression of osteoporosis. So that's something that we can discuss in the office. A lot of times we have to tackle all these problems at the same time. So we'll get a DEXA scan. We can send you to a rheumatologist or your OBGYN to try some of these medications. And then we can talk more about your back issues uh, and see if there's something more that we can do for you. So thanks for your question, Cheryl. All right, we have another one in the chat box. Um, it reads, I have a bulge disc. I've had bulge disc issues where the epidural has worked. Um, I've had three recently. Pain has changed where it's not in the back, but right flank above and into the buttocks. Now when I stand, now when I stand still like making coffee at the counter, there is no pain, but at first movement, it is excruciating. Have you ever countered this? What could it be? The last epidural was three weeks ago. So Sue, that's another great question. Um, it's a very common uh, thing that patients will say to us where they're doing certain things and they're totally fine, but the moment they do anything that's you know, strenuous, uh, they have pain. Now for you, it doesn't even seem like it's a strenuous problem. You just changing position that can cause quite a bit of pain. Flank and buttock pain, you know, oftentimes can be a nerve 
The fact that you have an epidural indicates that you probably had some type of disc issue. When people stand still, uh, standing is actually more, more uh, uh, the standing position is less stress to the spine and the disc than sitting or getting up from a seated position. So it's, it's possible that when you stand, you find a position where the nerve is okay, but then when you turn and you put some stress on the spine and the disc, it can irritate the nerve and you get the pain into the buttock. The epidural can take up to two weeks to work. And the fact that you've already had three and you're still having some symptoms suggests that you might have significant nerve compression that may not benefit any more from conservative treatment options. You know, I always tell patients, you have to like, honestly assess your pathology. So if you have a small disc bulge or annular tear, I oftentimes don't recommend surgery because people will get better with therapy, medicines, and injections. But if you have a large disc herniation causing structural nerve compression, you can have as many injections as you want. You can have as many therapy, inversion table sessions, acupuncture that you want. But until you take the, the structural compression off the nerve, you're going to feel miserable. So everyone's pain threshold is very different. So Sue, if, if you want, we're happy to evaluate your MRI and, and see if there's something that we can do for you. But if you've tried multiple epidurals and you have pain, even with a simple maneuver like turning position, uh, it may be worthwhile to come have an evaluation. Great. And it looks like we have one more um, in our Q&A box. General question, how do you start the process of having your back examined for pain? Go to your general practitioner to get a referral. Start with Rothman. I injured my back in a car accident in 1984, but need to get it re-examined after all these years due to the increase in pain and the beginning of decreased ability to bend over. Uh, thank you, Anne, for your question. I'm sorry that you have all this discomfort. So. Uh, either way is fine. I mean, we're happy to see you as long as your insurance uh, doesn't require you to have a referral uh, to see a specialist. Um, our staff, Jen and Reggie today, can get your information and give you a call and see if we can see you uh, without having to have you see a, your GP. Um, but we're happy to help you either way. Uh, if you do come into the office, if you can bring any prior films, that'd be great. But what we do in our office, we'll examine you. We have an x-ray in, in all of our offices, so we can x-ray you uh, that day. And then depending on your exam uh, and, and, and when we discuss, we'll most likely need an MRI and we can talk about treatment options there. So we're happy to help, Anne. Uh, I think um, if you uh, reach out to our, our uh, moderators today, they can help you with an appointment to see us. Awesome. I think... You covered. Does anyone have any more questions? I think we have. I think we covered all of them. Well, thank you everyone for joining this evening and thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, and as Dr. Lee said, if anyone has any questions after tonight or if they would like to schedule an appointment to see Dr. Lee or any of our physicians, um, my email address is on the reply to email for the invitation that you received. So you can reach out to me directly and I can um, arrange to get you scheduled immediately with one of our physicians, Dr. Lee. And thank you everyone and have a great night. Thanks everyone. Have a good night, everyone. Good night.